Welcome to GoPro with Eric Worre. My name is Eric Worre, and it's not often that you get to talk to a living legend. And that's what we're going to have today. Mr. Bob Proctor is literally a living legend. He has been engaged in the personal development space, the human achievement and performance space for over 50 years, 50 years of service, 50 years of contribution, 50 years of ideas and strategies. He's worked with all the legends. He is one of the last of a generation that impacted this world in an incredible way. You might have seen him in the, in the movie, The Secret. He's written many best-selling books, incredible courses. He is um, really special and he loves the network marketing profession. So I sat down with Bob recently to get his insights on success, on overcoming your limiting beliefs, on how to reprogram your mind for success, how to change the stories, the negative stories in your mind and replace them with positive stories. We also talk about network marketing and his thoughts about network marketing, but pay special attention like Jim Rohn, like Brian Tracy, like Les Brown, like the Harvey McKay's and uh, the Earl Nightingale's and the incredible thought leaders that have come before us. This is one that is standing before us today. Enjoy the conversation with the one and only Bob Proctor. Bob Proctor, my friend, legend, uh, incredible leader, mentor to millions of people around the world, one of the sharpest dressers I know. I, I, I want to know, as we start this, do you go to bed in a suit and tie? <laughs> I've been accused of it, Eric. Oh my gosh, I mean, you are so dapper all the time. I mean, it's just like I'm wearing jeans underneath that, you know, uh, sitting underneath this desk. Uh, I've, I've got to feel like you're in a, you know, $10,000 suit um, all the time. Uh, what, I, as we start, I want to talk about your career and I want to talk about what you're doing in order to be able to help so many people around the world succeed. But as we start, because it's so iconic, your image and how you show up in the world, what made you make that decision? Because it is a decision to be so on point all the time. Good question. There is an answer to that. When I started, Eric, I um, I was shy. I had absolutely no sales experience. I had no business experience. I had a bad work record. And I was, I met a man, he gave me this book, Think and Grow Rich. And he said, Bob, he said, if you'll read this, never stop reading it and do exactly what I tell you, you can have anything you want. Well, I didn't believe that, but I believed he believed it. And I don't know why I was 26. I had never followed anybody's advice up to that time, but I decided I would do that. Well, everything began to change very quickly. And one thing led to another that led me into a number of different books. And I read a book, How Showmanship Sells by uh, Elmer G. Letterman. And he sold $1,250,000 worth of insurance his first day in the insurance business, and that was in 1921, when if a person sold a million in a year, they were considered a star. He was 21 years old in 1921. He had been wearing a pair of shoes at a party a couple of years before this, very young guy, and a man came over to him twice during the party and complimented him on his shoes. On the third time he came, he offered to take the man to his bootmaker. The man's name was A.E. Lefcroft. He was a builder in New York. And he and Elmer Letterman became friends. One a seasoned professional, the other a young man just starting. And he invited all his friends to this party that he threw for Elmer Letterman his first day in insurance. 
And he told them this was his new friend. And he said, um, I want you to all buy a policy from him. And he sold a million two hundred fifty thousand dollars worth of insurance in that day. Then he had all his buildings. He had a plaque put in the lobby of the buildings that this building and its contents are insured by Elmer G. Letterman and Associates. Elmer Letterman was one of the best dressed men in his day. He had 30 suits. I had one suit and it was a very coarse tweed. And it was a hot summer and that thing would scratch my legs. I had to press it every night to keep a seam in it. But I made up my mind that I would have 30 suits. Then, now this, I'm going back a long ways. Arthur Godfrey was on television. He had Tony Marvin was his pitch man. Tony Marvin, tall, dark guy, great set of pipes. And he stood up to make a pitch one time and Elmer Letterman or um, Arthur Godfrey said, Tony, how many suits you got? He's all about 60. I thought 60 suits, 30 suits. And I had one. And it was reading that book. And at that time, I made up my mind out of 30 suits. I buy a lot of suits. I have a special suit maker. He, um, the trick is in measuring. I buy my shoes at Artioli in France or in, in um, Italy. I got to know the man that owns it. And clothes are a very big part of my world. And it was from that. I was following the directions of the books that I was reading. And that's where that started. We, we live in a world that's kind of permanent casual Friday. Mm -hmm. um, I, I made a decision to, to dress on purpose in my public life as best as I possibly could. And that served me very well over the course of, of the years. Uh, how do you think it served you? Oh, it's, it served me well. Just, just I, in, uh, in respect or in how you uh, think of yourself or posture or what? Well, I think probably it goes back to what I think of myself hmm. um, and what I think you think of me. I read one time, I think it was in a Reader's Digest, where it said, I'm not who I think I am. I am not who you think I am. I am who you think, who I think you think I am. And, you know, I believe there's truth in that. Let me repeat it. I am not who I think I am. I am not who you think I am. I am who I think you think I am. And I believe that I have created this image, I guess. I've just always been dressed that way. I would always be well-dressed. And I buy good clothes. <laughs> I buy a lot of them. And I would feel very uncomfortable if I wasn't. Hmm. So it's, um, you know, I deal a lot with paradigms. That's my paradigm. Yeah. But it's not one I choose to change. And I sure. do realize yeah. that we are in a time where casual dress is more as accepted than shirt and tie and suit. However, I would feel that I would feel very uncomfortable and I would feel that it would be out of place for me to go into a seminar with jeans and a sweater, although for many other people it would not be. Right. So it's, um, yeah, it's part of the image, it's part of my paradigm. Yeah. But it, and I think it has served me. For sure. Uh, it, and and I, I didn't intend to start the, the conversation talking about clothing, but but I, I just find it interesting in, in part of the overall brand. Talk about paradigms. A lot of people don't even know what the word means. Well, you know, that's so true. I mean, that what you've just said is, is a mouthful of what it really is. The average individual, when I started, when I started to look for a meaning of it, Eric, I had a very difficult time. I went into books and psychology and psychiatry and behavioral science. And whatever I read, 
course, I have come to the conclusion a long time ago that most of those books written by psychologists, psychiatrists, behavioral scientists are written for other psychologists, psychiatrists, behavioral. The, uh, the layperson on the street um, has difficulty understanding what's written. And I see a paradigm. Most of the definitions I did not understand. Uh, when I dissected it, I got to understand it. I see paradigms as a multitude of ideas that are fixed in our subconscious mind that control our behavior, our habitual behavior, and almost all of our behavior is habitual. And I think it's one of the greatest problems um, that people in any industry or any business face. I have spent a um, oh good part of 50 years working with the idea and helping companies understand it. And I believe when people start to understand paradigms and really understand how to change it, everything in their world changes. I, I first learned about it. I first heard the term by Joel Barker. You, you know Joel Barker? Sure. Yeah. Um, he wrote a yeah. book paradigm back around 1990. Yeah, and and he was a he was a Minneapolis guy, and I'm 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 from Minnesota. So, uh, watching his presentation about paradigms and reading the book, I was introduced to it. Is uh, is it too simplistic to call it kind of your mental programming? Like if you're if well, your mind not too simplistic at all. In is, fact, I think that's exactly what it is. Yeah, you see, we're we're programmed genetically, and then after birth, we're programmed environmentally. Mm-hmm. And the paradigm has been built by someone else. Right. The paradigm has been built by ancient ancestors. It's, it's, uh, it's our belief system. It's all the habit patterns in our subjective mind, and it controls our behavior. And the person that doesn't understand it, that, that's why we have such a high percentage of people struggling. Right. And you certainly see it in network marketing where you're involved. Sure. Um, it runs rampant in network marketing. Well, they, they say, uh, think you grow rich, thoughts become things as a man thinketh, all that stuff. Um, and, and you've been, um, a, a, not only a student, but, a a teacher and a philosopher in that space, yeah. uh, for, for decades, uh, you know, and the, on a simplistic side from Jim Rohn, when I was first kind of, uh, he, he said, here, you know, here's a handful of things. Your thoughts determine your attitudes. Your attitudes determine your actions. Your actions determine your results, right? Your, your results determine your lifestyle. You want to change your thinking. You got to like change your programming and programming comes from lots of different things. Belief systems, uh, environment, uh, you know, what you're feeding your mind with. Uh, what I've become fascinated with uh, lately and I talked with John Asaraf about this recently also because he's interested in the mind um, studies also, is the subconscious mind. There's the conscious part where we're programming ourselves or we've been programmed and we need to be kind of actively reprogramming. And then there's the subconscious. Um, and that's the part that makes certain opportunities invisible to us and other things very visible, something sensitive, some things totally ignored. Uh, uh, and and your subconscious can actually sabotage your success. I've realized, uh, and you know, through, from your own self worth or how you were raised or anything else, you're the expert on all this. Whether it's conscious or subconscious, I find it fascinating because I think unlocking our mind's potential, we're as as good as we are at unlocking technology around the world uh, and figuring out the mysteries of the physical world. I think we're we're in the stone ages when it comes to figuring out the mysteries of the mind and how yeah. to un unlock the mind's potential. So talk no with everybody about, about that. Absolutely. No question about it. You said where it can sabotage, but not only can, it does. Hmm. And it does sabotage the, uh, the success of a high 90%. It sabotages the success of anyone that does not understand how that conditioning was formed, and the conditioning is the paradigm, and how it can be changed. And the subconscious mind really controls the behavior. The conscious mind makes choices. Think of this for a moment. When we go to school, we gather information, and they want to make sure we got the information, so they give us exams or tests at you know, various times throughout the school year. 
And if you pass the test, you'll end up passing the year and you get the grades and then you ultimately you get the degree. Well, we've got thousands of people graduating from universities with um, all kinds of degrees and yet they're miserable failures. Hmm. You know, you do personally, I do personally know people who are absolutely brilliant and yet they're failing miserably. You see, we gather information in our conscious mind and we store it there. And that's where we go if they ask us a question to pass an exam. But that's not the part that controls our behavior. The part that behold, controls the behavior is the subjective or the subconscious mind. And it is totally subjective. It's immoral. It does not care what you plant, but it'll express what you plant. I have been studying this for 57 years this year. I study it every day because I'm absolutely fascinated with it. Now, I became a, a serious student, first of Napoleon Hill and then of Earl Nightingale, almost simultaneous. And then I had the good fortune of working with Earl for five years. And he and Lloyd Conant. And uh, Earl was very much into the mind. The mind controls everything. In the little book, As a Man Thinketh, James Allen said, mind is the master power that molds and makes, and man is mind. And evermore he takes the tool of thought and shaping what he wills, brings forth a thousand joys or a thousand ills. We think in secret and it comes to pass. Environment is but our looking glass. Now there's so much depth in that little poem. It's wild. But you see, all of our beliefs are locked up in our paradigm. And what we should do is ask where they come from. And most of them are absolutely absurd. The beliefs, the things we believe are so ridiculous that when you start to really question them, you wonder, why did I ever believe that? See, the problem is we don't question them. Mom said, dad said, grandma said, well, they were like God when we were little kids. And the idea was accepted and never questioned. And yet, it's our belief system that controls everything. Now, I got to a point one time where I was studying the religions and studying science and studying everything I get my hands on. And the belief idea really got welded in my mind. And I started to ask myself, well, how do you form a belief? How do you believe? How do you change beliefs? And that really started to play on me because I couldn't get the answer to it. And I had a mentor, Bill Van de Waal. He was an absolutely brilliant human being. And he's gone now, God bless him, but he helped a lot of people. And a lot of people in network marketing would know him. But he, one time, we were having something to eat, and he just, in conversation, said, our belief system's based upon our evaluation of something. And frequently, if we reevaluate a situation, our belief about the situation will change. Well, you know, it's just like where bells going off in my head, because at that particular time in my life, I was studying this very seriously. I was winning, but I couldn't tell you why I was winning. I earned over a million dollars and I had absolutely no idea why. People would ask me and I'd say, well, I'm cleaning offices. And that's what I was doing. Well, he just like that turned a light on. And all of a sudden, I realized how my life had changed. I had changed my belief system through the studying. I started to study this book. I read it still every day. Now, I don't start at the front, read to the back. I just let it fall open, and I read for a page, maybe three pages. I might read a chapter if I get really into it. But I read some of it every day. And it was through reading this and listening to the recordings of Earl's over and over and over again and studying some of the great teachers then I realized I was reevaluating who I was. And I started to change my image. I started to change my belief about what I could do. And that's I, really what a person has to do. Can, let, me, let me ask you a couple questions about that. Um, <clears throat> for those that are listening on audio, I, I, he was holding up uh, Think and Grow Rich that he was reading every day. The, uh, I think the, the first step before you can reprogram is a real honest um, process of self-awareness, and it yeah. and and 
and because the subconscious, sometimes we're doing things we don't even know why, like you said, how do you, how do you encourage somebody or guide somebody in the process of self-evaluation to be able to figure out where their limiting beliefs are, where their programming challenges are, where their paradigm belief systems are, uh, in order to be able to say, is this serving me or is it not? Because you can't reprogram something truly consciously if you don't know what you're trying to reprogram, right? So I'll give you an example. Um, I had so many self-worth issues growing up that I thought I had conquered and because I was making money, but I never had much, even though I was making a lot. I found a way to always be scrappy behind the eight ball, be the underdog, um, <clears throat> not have a lot of wealth accumulate or stay within my hands very often because on a subconscious level, I felt guilty about having that money uh, because of my own self-worth. It took me decades to realize, oh my gosh, that's sabotage. Uh, if I had recognized that earlier, which I, I wasn't able to consciously do. My wife helped me recognize that and some other friends helped me recognize that. And I was like, oh, and as soon as I did, everything shifted. Things started to, to accumulate. My ability to give to the world changed dramatically. Uh, I, still, I still work to reprogram that, but, but it took decades to even know that it was there. How does somebody figure out what's, what, what is in their programming, what's holding them back? How do they start to be able to figure out uh, where to go? Well, you know, Napoleon Hill talks one of his principles about organized information intelligently directed. And that's what you have to have. You have to have the right information. I think Solomon put it very well. He said, in all you're getting, get understanding. You have to understand, first of all, why you're doing what you're doing, why life is the way it is, and then you have to understand how to change that. But how do you, how do you and, figure out, how do you figure out, like a person, and, and forgive me for asking it over and over, but, but I'm, I'm really seeking it, you know, because a person says, well, I'm just lazy, I just procrastinate. Well, that's not the cause. That, that's not no, part of think, their DNA. No. Um, no. There's some fear-based thing that's causing them not to take action. They're labeling it as procrastination or lazy or, or rebellious or whatever. But it's there's all some... part of the paradigm, Mary. It's yeah, paradigm. yeah. So how do, how do they identify? Well, see, as a little child, when you're born into an environment, your subconscious mind is wide open. There's no filter. The conscious faculty has not developed. You have a reasoning factor. You have perception, the will, imagination, memory, intuition. These are all higher faculties that make us who we are. They have not developed. The subconscious mind is like an open cup. So whatever is going on around, whatever talk is going on around, goes right into the subconscious mind. That's how the self-image is formed. Your self-worth, your self-image is formed when you're an infant. And so these ideas are all programmed together in the subconscious mind. We're not taught anything about this in school. You can go right through school and learn nothing about it. You could become a psychiatrist. I've met many of them or a psychologist. Do not understand what we're talking about. Now, that sounds like it's right out of the box, but that's, that's the truth and that's the way it is. A person has to, first of all, understand what causes success, what causes failure. It's the same cause. You see, something like yourself I had, I was, I followed the direction that I was given by Ray, who gave me the book, and I did the things that I had to do, and I, I became very successful from nothing, no formal education, and I've got a company that's operating in seven cities, cities in three different parts of the world, and um, I had no idea why, and a similar thing happened to me like happened to you. I was earning over a million bucks. I was living in London, England. I go down to Playboy, Play Roulette. I didn't care if I lost. And because I didn't care if I lost, I usually won. And I didn't care because I knew where the money come from. 
And then all of a sudden, one day I stopped and I thought, this isn't very responsible way to live. And it's, I think I had some kind of a euphoric experience like you must have. And I thought, why am I winning? I've been raised to believe if you're going to earn a lot of money, you got to be really smart. I knew that wasn't true. I wasn't very smart. And I was earning a lot of money. I was raised to believe if you're going to get a good job, you have to have a good formal education. I knew that wasn't true. I had two months high school. I didn't have a good job. I owned the company. I had everybody working for me. So I started to think almost everything I've been taught is not true. So I started to study. It took me nine and a half years and I was searching for the answer. And that's what you're asking. Mm -hmm. I was searching. It took me nine and a half years. And I finally got it. And when I did get it put together, all I ever wanted to do is teach it. And that is, in essence, what I teach, Eric. That's what all my programs are based on. That's I've, everything. I found that two, two things were helpful for me. Um, one, to, to uh, start the process of self-awareness. One is to examine the, your life patterns. Mm -hmm. What are the things that keep happening? This keeps happening in my health. This keeps happening in my relationships. This keeps happening with my money. This keeps happening with my business. Whatever. It just keeps happening over and over. And you you have a story that you tell yourself as to why it's happening. And you don't realize that you're creating this repeating pattern. Um, so that's one area to be able to kind of change your awareness to understand how to re what might need to be reprogrammed. Uh, your belief systems about those things. Second is just the what are the symptoms? It might not be a repeating pattern, but what's the general life symptoms that you're dealing with? And and are, are those symptoms taking you in the positive direction or not? Uh, and if they're not, then, then it's something that you could raise your awareness on, really examine, uh, ask good friends or good mentors for their perspective on you, uh, be willing to take input from others, at least uh, in the evaluation stage to realize where some limiting beliefs might be. Because I think, like you said, limiting beliefs get planted in a person's mind and it's our job to weed those out and replace them with empowering beliefs. Um, I, I think if there's any, frankly, any, uh, I've, and I've, I've come to this conclusion in the last couple of years, Bob, if there's any epidemic, it's an epidemic of thinking small. Um, I'm our, about it. We, as a world, if we have the courage to think bigger and without having to see any justification or rationale from any other source, just the courage to think bigger, the, the, the limits that we think that are in our lives are not really there. You know, the book, The Magic of Thinking, made by Schwartz, is probably one of the best books I ever read. Lloyd Conant got me reading that. In, in what you're talking about, limiting beliefs is a term, I don't know who coined it, but it's been around now for quite a while, and that's all part of the paradigm. Mm. The limiting belief can be in relationships, it can be in your health, your ability to earn money, your ability to sell, to build a business. The, limit is, the limiting beliefs are all part of the paradigm, but they're all part of the self-image, it's how we see ourselves. We have not been taught anything about ourselves. And as we start to study this, one of the best books I ever read and on self-introspection is by um, um, The uh, Mystic Past to Cosmic Consciousness by Vernon Howard. It's a phenomenal book. Not an easy book to read, but you're really going to take a look at yourself. Now, here's a, here's a crazy part of all this. Mo and I found this, this is true because I've worked in every industry you can think of over the past 50 years. Almost all people that are really successful cannot articulate on why they are. They're what you call unconscious competence. They have shifted the paradigm. They've made the changes, but they don't know what they've done. I did that. I was an unconscious competent. That's when I was living in England. And I suddenly realized, I have no idea what the hell I'm doing. I was just winning. People say, what are you doing? Well, I'm cleaning offices. Listen, that was almost incidental to what I was doing. I could have been selling cars or uh, windows for houses. I would have been successful. It was the habit patterns that I formed. 
It was what I had done. I changed the paradigm. Your paradigm is formed through repetition. You're hearing the same thing over and over and over again. How many times did you have to hear Eric before you ever responded to it? God only knows. Maybe your mother might guess accurately, but nobody knows. Well, the paradigm's formed through repetition, and it's only changed one of two ways, either through repetition or an emotional impact. Emotional impacts is not generally how a paradigm's changed. And when it is, it's usually of a negative so nature. So a, a, a person has a heart attack and they change the way they eat uh, or something like that. Is that what you're saying? Possibly. Yeah. You yeah, know, so some, be, some big massive life trauma. Or somebody uh, losing a loved one. That yeah. can be an emotional impact. 9-11 was an emotional impact, not for me, but for anybody living right around it or anybody that lost somebody there. But emotional impact, we've even created programs where we attempted to create an emotional impact. And you might get one or two, but you it's don't get It's still repetition, everything. isn't it? No, it's the repetition. And, and it's the repetition that's very difficult to accept. Look at, see this is a book holder. Mm -hmm. I have this book holder because Earl Langell had a book holder on his desk. And I've got a paragraph outline because he had a paragraph outline on his desk. I went to visit him and I saw this and I observed as much as I could and paid attention to everything that he said. Let me read you this. He said, to enter into the spirit of anything then is to make yourself one in thought with the creative principle that is at the center of it. And therefore, why not go to the center of all things at once and enter into the spirit of life? Do you ask where to find it? In yourself. And in proportion you find it there, you will find it everywhere else. Now, that's out of an essay that was written by Thomas Troward in 1903, Entering into the Spirit. It comes from a magnificent book called Hidden Power. I started to study Troward in 1968, and I've never stopped. He really gets into it in depth. And the difficulty in getting people into the repetition, they first of all have to really understand why repetition is necessary. They've got to see it and understand it. And then they have to discipline themselves to do it. Because you can understand it, but still not discipline yourself to do it. What's the best way that you think to uh, reinforce the repetition side of things? Is it, is it, is it books? Is it audio? Is it events? Is it coaching? Is it mentorship? Uh, is it a combination? What What have you I'm seen to be the most effective? Like I'm going to okay. take this one second. Yeah, great. And then everybody can see this, but you will. So you, it was on. It was on. Uh, the modern world. Vinyl records. Yeah. I drove around listening to that on a battery-operated record player. I got that I would have that thing playing all the time unless I was talking to someone about something. So audio was the key for you. Oh, no question about it. Yeah, I, 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 it was the key for me too. I'd be listening. To, uh, you, you know what I miss more than anything? Cassettes. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. cassettes were just amazing in cars. But sure. um, the great thing and the reason why I started the podcast uh, is now you can have it on your device. It's within a touch. There's no cost uh, or very little cost. And you, you can have that repetition working for you. Well, you know, there's people, you know, a lot of them that that I've worked with that really started to understand this repetition who are doing very very well like they're multi-million dollar producers but they were unconscious confidence and most are most do not know why they're winning and therefore they don't even have the opportunity to, to um, pass it on to their own children yeah but when they started to understand it and then they had a desire to get it to their people they fell in love with the idea i think you have probably a better opportunity than anyone I know in our industry, and I consider you a part of our industry. 
where you're genuinely interested and you spend your life trying to help people understand what we're talking about so that they can change their life and begin winning. Right. Well, um, I think the idea of the repetition, why it's necessary, has to be effectively communicated somehow. Because I honestly believe that is the hurdle. People, now, people listen say, to something one time and they think they've listened to it. They well, watch one YouTube say, video, they think it's over. They say, I know that, and they don't. No. But you see, we've been programmed to believe that. Listen, when you're reading a book, you read what's in the book, and you can repeat it. You think you've got it. Well, I, I heard a person say, uh, I can't remember who said it. There was a there was an incidental byproduct of limited options. Okay, um, you had a limited option by having a portable battery operated record player uh, in your vehicle or in your house or whatever. You didn't have 5,000 choices, 8,000 channels, uh -huh. uh, a million things. So because you had that, you listened to it over and over and over and over and over and over. For me, it started with a Jim Rohn audio cassette uh, bootlegged off of a Shackley convention that I listened to 500 times called The Seed and the Sower. And then it was the Challenge to Succeed audio set that I could literally give that seminar Um you know, three or four hours worth of material, I probably listened to 500 to 1,000 times that helped to reshape my mind. But now we have so many options. We're like, we're on to the next thing. We're on to the next thing. Uh, YouTube's uh, uh, suggesting another video for us to watch. Uh, you know, as soon as we're done with this, but this podcast, there's another one. And somebody else is all trying to distract us. So the, the, the quote I heard was, um, learn less study more instead of skimming 500 books study 10 of them uh you know pick pick the ones that are gonna have the biggest impact on your life go ahead and skim till you find one but when you find one that has a big impact study the magic of thinking big study uh you know one of your books or one of your programs study thinking grow rich study as a man thinketh um those types of things instead of just skimming the world. We're all audience members and nobody's not playing on the field. I, you know, I say a similar thing when I say no amount of reading or memorizing is going to make you successful. Mm. It's the understanding and application of wise thoughts that count. It doesn't matter whether you ever finish reading the book. Do you understand and apply what you're reading? And you see, it's the repetition that will cause you to do that. And without the repetition, you're not going to do it. Yeah. The old paradigm just takes over and automatically starts doing it. Now, you know, it's a shame because very good people are burning themselves out. They're wearing themselves out. They're spending their time. They're spending their money, but they're not getting it because school has created part of the paradigm is I read the book. It's over. You passed the test. It's yeah, done. That's part of our paradigm. Well, We've got to understand that that paradigm is not giving us what we want. It's not giving us what we are designed to get. I believe we are God's highest form of creation. I believe our spiritual DNA is perfect. There's perfection within us. And it's that perfection within us that's seeking expression within through us that cause us to want stuff. And then we're told, oh, you always want, you always want. And you're told that as a kid. It's a damn good thing you are. It's the wants that cause you to want to grow, to cause you to stretch. And you don't want to get. You want so you'll grow. Yes. That's why the pins in the companies are great. Yeah. I want that pin. I want this level. I want to read that. That's good because that's going to cause the person to grow. They've got to develop themselves and grow into that particular place. Well, I, I, the the world is designed right now to distract us from our focus. Um, the media, the politics, social media, all the tools, all the advertisers, they're all trying to get our attention. They're all trying to, to get us to consume their content, to look at their ads, to look at their stuff. And I think it's really... 
robbing a person's potential to engage in the repetition that will give them the results that they're looking for. They well, think they're busy. Earlier, you said the similar thing, what you just said, you said earlier, when you said it quite different, where we have too many options. Mm. I didn't have. Options are actually not our friend. This no, many. Not. But if you face the reality of the whole situation, we have the options. Sure. And they're numerous. And they're coming at us from six different ways to Sunday. And we're always wondering, what's the next breakthrough? What's it going to be? Well, it won't matter what it is. The percentages do not change very much. Mm. The percentages don't change much because all the people that are being controlled by paradigm that have the potential, they've all got the potential. They never gain the understanding of how to change that paradigm. They don't even understand the paradigm is the cause of the problem. And when they start to see that, because it's the paradigm that produces the result, mm -hmm. the paradigm controls the vibration you're in. The vibration dictates how you act. But it, not just how you act, it controls what you attract. What do you mean by vibration that you're in? Is, well, that, is that your attitude, has, your, well, your state? Is the law. No, vibration is the law of the universe. The, the whole universe operates by law. Well, vibrate, the law of vibration decrees that everything moves, nothing rests. Um, this, um, this book is moving. Mm -hmm. At one time, it was, it, was a, it was a tree. Then it turned into paper. And then we turned it into a book. Your body is moving. It's moving so fast it appears to be still. When you move out of it, the body still moves. Now, this is going a little fair with it, but you'll, you'll get it. There's no such thing as death. If nothing is created or destroyed, if nothing's created or destroyed, then that only postulates the theory of life. When the soul moves out of the body, the body does not dead. If the body was dead, it wouldn't move. And if it didn't move, how did it ever change to dust? The whole universe moves. Everything moves. We say this is paper because of the vibration it's in. We say my hand, this is skin because of the vibration it's in. Vibration is the law of the universe. There's millions of levels of vibration. It's a vibration that we phone on. Your frequency, vibration, the levels of vibration are called frequencies. But we communicate on frequencies. Your body operates on a frequency. Now, this would be an appropriate place to say this. In Think and Grow Rich, on the first page of decision, he points out that all the successful people make decisions very fast, change them very slow, even when they change them at all. For a long time, I wondered, how do they make their decisions so fast? Why do they make them so fast? What separates them? Don't they have to gather information? Don't they have to get a lot of advice? And the answer is, no, they don't. The only prerequisite to making a decision is, do you want it? Do you want to do it? And when you want to, they want it, they're going to do it. They make the decision. When they make the decision, they flip their mind onto a higher frequency. And they flip their mind onto the frequency that they have to be on to attract the good they have to attract. Hmm. Everything's already here. Nothing's created or destroyed. So everything's already here. You've got to get in harmony with the good that you want to attract into your life. Attraction became very big because of the secret. Hell, attraction's always been around. You attract whatever you're in harmony with. Tony, Tony Robbins calls it state. Um, you know, changing your state. Same your, thing. Your, 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 your Same. energetic level. I mean, can I ask you how old you're, you are? 84. 84 years old, and uh, you act like you're 44. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that that the the energy that you're talking about uh, has to be translated into your physical body by exactly. choice. Absolutely. Over time, what do you think your secret is there to harnessing that consistently to being vibrant and active and and uh, uh, an example of what's same possible in all of us? Is, same for me as it is for you. It's got nothing to do with age. You translate it into all that because you love it. Hmm. You love it. You love what you do. Yeah. You probably couldn't quit it. But you're in better shape than you at, at 84 than I am at 54. Well, I wouldn't it's say ridiculous. that. But, yeah, but, you know, if you love what you do, that's the great secret of life. Hmm. I was very fortunate. Uh, I was in the cleaning business, cleaning offices and doing very well. But that was almost incidental, as I mentioned earlier. I could have been doing anything. Well, one day at the end of a sales meeting, 
I was playing The Strangest Secret. We played at every sales meeting. I said, God, I'd love to meet him. And one of the guys says, no, you wouldn't. I said, what do you mean I wouldn't? He said, if you wanted to meet him, you'd go and meet him. I thought, damn, he's right. So now Earl Nightingale was the most listened to man in the history of the broadcasting industry at that time. This would be around 1965, something like that. So anyway, I phoned in. I got an appointment with him. I shocked myself. So off I went to Chicago. They were at 333 North Michigan. And I got an hour with him. And when I was leaving, I said, Earl, what is the real deal? Like, I mean, what, what, what the hell's the big secret? You know, well, he said, there isn't any secret. He said, the big deal is just sit down and decide what you love to do and then make a decision to dedicate your life to it. He said, the problem with most people is they never figure out what they love to do and they don't dedicate their life to anything. Well, I'm going to tell you, I almost come out of my skin. I was so turned on because I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to do what he was doing and I wanted to do it with him. And I made a decision right there and then that that's what I would do. Now it took me three years, but I was in an office just next to his. I was his vice president of sales in 1968. And I had the good fortune of working very closely with he and Lloyd Conan for five years. And I was exposed then to all the top thinkers because he hung up. You know, I could go with you all day and and I'm going to introduce our audience to as much of your information material as possible because I think you are a, a global treasure and I think your wisdom is enormous. Um, give me your opinion on network marketing. This, this profession that we love so much, you look at it from a third-party perspective over a lot of years. Um, what do you think of this profession and and what have you seen as far as its maturity and development in recent decades? Well, you're going to answer it two different ways. First of all, I'm frequently asked by people, what would you do if you were starting over? I would be involved in network marketing. Definitely. I think it is one of the most incredible ways of setting up multiple sources of income and all wealthy people have multiple sources of income. They have, I've studied this, right. go right back to the days of the ancient Babylonians. They all had multiple sources of income. So what do I think of it? That's what I think about. I think it's probably one of the best ideas that's ever come down the pipe. I've been around it since Rich DeVos uh, was selling the soap out of his garage. And I've been around it that long. Has it matured? Tremendously, tremendously. And... Um, not to flatter you, but I think it's people like yourself that's helped in that maturity. I think you are bringing people that have understanding together and helping them help the ones that don't have the understanding. Um, I truly believe, though, that someone has to really get the idea out into network marketing on paradigms, how they're formed and how they're changed. Because that's what's causing the breakdown. People come in, and you know this, everybody knows it. Let's say I'm in, I get recruited into network marketing. My first responsibility is going out and recruit some other people into network marketing. So I recruit them in. I can't teach those people. I don't know enough. I don't know anything. So I can't help them. And they're not going to get the help. And the person that recruited me probably didn't know anything. So he can't help me or she can't help me. Now, every now and then, there's someone that's a damn good leader, and they see that they're building leaders, and that the product is just something that's moving through the organization they're building. But those people are not in the majority. They're the same as in car sales, or in insurance sales, or in real estate, or in anything else. The majority do not understand this concept of paradigm. They don't understand that they are being controlled by a program in their subconscious mind. I believe network marketing is incredible. The opportunity for growth, they've got all the pieces in there, all these uh, pins and levels. Man, there's nothing like recognition if you want to get a person to run. So it's all there. I think that's what it's missing. It'll get it eventually um, because it's getting everything else. I mean, it is growing. It's becoming much more respectable. You're getting people into it now that, back in 1960 would have never looked at it yeah and doctors and lawyers and engineers and professionals men and women and building strong organizations well i'm, I'm gonna have to understand that 
I'm going to continue the work to to try to help to educate people to reprogram their minds effectively. And we're going to do everything we can to get your information and you personally connected to share this information to be able to help create the change that is necessary for more people to step into an entrepreneurial mindset versus an employee mindset, a, a independent mindset versus a dependent mindset. These yeah. major paradigms that need to shift in order for people to step into their, their real potential inside of this profession. Bob, I, I really appreciate you, my friend. I, I, I value the fact that we have the ability to talk to each other. I, I love working with you. I admire what you've done. I, I'm in awe of what you're doing, and uh, I think your best is yet to come. So uh, thank you for taking the time, sharing with everybody your wisdom. It's been my pleasure, Eric. And I got to congratulate you on what you're doing, because I think you're you're impacting network marketing like nobody ever has, and I think you're doing it the right way, and you do a phenomenal job. You really do. You reach so many people. In fact, you've gone into all the companies. That is the genius in what you're doing, and I know you know that, so you will never spoil it. <laughs> Thank you, my friend. Any way I can do that to help you, I'd love to. I appreciate you very much. Love Thank you, brother. You. Okay, my friend. Talk to you later, Eric. All right. Talk to you soon. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Bob Proctor. He is really something special. And all of the things that we talked about, we'll put into the show notes below. All the things that he referenced, we'll put into the show notes below. Listen to this more than once. Listen to this over and over. You can fill a journal with what he talked about. A lifetime of lessons, five, six decades worth of lessons that you could pick up from some of the highlights over the course of the last 60 minutes or so. Put that into your notes, put that into your life and let it serve you. Let it start changing the paradigms of your mind and leading you into a better direction. That's our show for this week. I hope you got value. Look forward to seeing you next time.